the 11th of October, 2470 Johann Gustafsson, PhD 335 Central Park West New York City, NY10025 RE, your continued support dear Dr. Gustafsson we here at the Nicola Foundation would like to thank you for your ongoing support through the years, and most recently for your donation of $2 million for the advancement of the Foundation's goals. With your help, the Nicola Foundation can continue its goals of ensuring that humanity will spread from the world of its birth, and ensure only the best aspects of our species will spread to other worlds. Our storied foundation has a proven track record of using the latest and best of scientific research to not only build the world's first interstellar generation ship, but also the latest refinements in gene editing techniques to prepare for the future. Your generous support allows our genetic purity and enhancement techniques to continue to improve. Even now, we have prepared genetic samples of hundreds of donors, ensuring that when the generation ship arrives in the new location, only the most ideal humans are bred and born to take advantage of this unparalleled opportunity. Right now, your support has garnered you the thanks and recognition of the Foundation's Board of Directors as a gold level donor but we still need your help to make this dream a reality. For an additional donation of $7 million, you would be considered one of our platinum group, guaranteeing your genetic sample is included on board and in the first batch of new humans to be born on humanity's next new home world. Your genetic code has already been pre-screened and approved, its purity sufficient to meet the foundation's exacting standards. If you would like to be a part of this world-changing event, the Nicola Foundation would be pleased to ensure your genetic legacy and a place in the future of our species. I will be reaching out to you in the next few days to discuss this further, and to offer you a VIP pass to our next private conference that will be held in your city in just a few weeks. In the meantime, please take a look at the enclosed materials that discuss the project in more detail. We look forward to working with you, and seeing you in the stars. Sincerely Edward Shands Senior Outreach Manager Nicola Foundation for Human Advancement 6 months. It will take 3 months for the alien ship to reach their destination said Zia. Which means we have, at a minimum, 6 months before they return in force. 6 months. I could do a lot with 6 months. It had been 2 weeks since we saw the alien craft vanish into FTL travel. I acknowledged Zia, and let her return to her research. We were up to 6 to 7 NI-12 researchers now, and the former HQ turned research facility was swarming with activity. I turned my attention back to my own construction projects. All across the surface of Ganymed, hundreds of new weapon emplacements were under construction. Coil gun emplacements complete with ammo tanks dedicated ammunition fabricators, and feedstock warehouses were being tied into the outpost's extensive infrastructure. Dozens of missile launch bays, each capable of launching 12 missiles in a 4-minute span, with an 8-minute reload window. 60 hangar bays, which, when fully equipped, could house 800 assault drones. Estimated construction time for all of this was 3 months. And that was just on Ganymed Outpost. Alpha and Bravo outposts were fully self sufficient now, but would only have about a fifth of Ganymed's military capacity by the end of the six month window. Charlie through Foxtrot would be self sufficient in three months, and would be able to contribute a token amount of several hundred assault drones between them. Gamma through Zulu wouldn't reach self sufficiency before the window was closed but they were prioritizing coil gun emplacements. The WASP-2 assault drone and Scorpion-2 assault drone designs were complete, and entering production now. Zia's Contragraph research team was going full bore, calculating the complex mathematics behind the gravity plate technology to create engines at a breakneck pace. The first place it was going was into the assault drones. The new drones had two Contragraph engines, one for movement the other to create a contragraph shield to deflect all but the fastest of projectiles. It wouldn't do much against lasers, but the heavy armor and high acceleration of the drones should minimize the effectiveness of such weapons. Anyway, I turned my attention to my next project. A skeletal framework was growing out of the side of Ganymed. We had no reason to hide now, and I had some things that would be much easier to build in space. 
so hundreds of meters of steel scaffolding was branching out to form a space yard for constructing larger craft. The framework contained an extension of the rail transport system, allowing rapid delivery of materials and construction drones in and out of the outpost. Massive fuel pipes and high-voltage electrical lines were being added even before the framework was complete, and a whole microcosm of cottage facilities were already sprouting up on the framework. Metal working facilities, repair shops for drones, warehouses, communications nodes, and antenna arrays were dotted along the entire assembly, and more were coming. But I wasn't waiting for a completed shipyard to get started on the big projects, because I had even bigger plans in mind. The space yard, once completed, would have 10 docks for craft that were as large as 200 meters wide, and were spaced in such a way that an even larger craft could be built while hanging off of the end. One kilometer past the end of the space yard, I was assembling a cargo dock, where completed ships could park and load or unload, even if they were too large to actually enter Ganym. The first three docks were the most complete, with the framework extending 100 meters into space. For these docks, the steel beams were installed. Construction here was on running all the ancillary pieces that needed that framework. But the docks were not empty. In each of them, my latest designs were taking shape. The skeleton of the new ships revealed clues to its final shape, a long, deadly, three-sided ship that tapered to a point. These ships would be armored with compressed titanium gold alloy armor layered on top of full iron armor. The nose of the craft would be almost all armor, and the angles of the nose would help deflect projectiles and provide an angle that would make lasers reflect off or have to burn through the armor the long way, assuming they could even hold the laser in place long enough to do damage. Bulges along all three sides housed coil guns and quad laser arrays, allowing the ship to fire off immense amounts of ammunition at once. The weapons mounts were more heavily armored than the Scorpion II assault drones making them hard targets. Along the central spine of the craft was a pair of coil guns so large that I dubbed them the long guns. The ability to compress atoms to make denser, stronger materials gave me some interesting options. Coil guns fired their ammunition so swiftly that it degraded the integrity of the barrels over time, requiring they be changed out regularly as part of basic maintenance. By using the same titanium gold alloy, I was able to make twin barrels that wouldn't degrade. The rest of the ship would fall into disrepair long before these needed replacing, even with heavy use. So I was able to increase the size of the ammunition, and correspondingly, their destructive potential. But that these long guns weren't even the most dangerous weapon. The pinnacle of humanity's destructive capability was easily in nuclear weaponry. There were 10 generations of weaponry to choose from for making nuclear weapons, and they had taken down the Orion Arm Trading Company ships the first time around. I had little desire to design complex missiles with nuclear bombs in them. They are finicky, maintenance intensive, and an all around pain in the neck. Since I didn't use fission reactors, I did have an awful lot of plutonium sitting around. I decided to give it to invaders. At high speeds. I took a page from early nuclear weapon design, where an explosive was used to propel one piece of nuclear fissile material into another piece to initiate nuclear fission. Most of the weapon design was purely for the intent of forcing the fissile material to go supercritical. But I didn't need explosives for that. I created 10 kg plutonium slugs, round balls of plutonium with deuterium and tritium cores which would boost the nuclear reaction and dramatically increase the destructive force. It wasn't quite thermonuclear, but it was good enough for what I was trying to do. I jacketed these slugs with bands of iron, and put them in a lead-lined ammo clip. Now a single bullet didn't do me a lot of good, unless the enemy was kind enough to have a chunk of plutonium sitting on their hulls. Since I didn't think that was too likely, I decided to add three coil guns near the nose of my new warships. These three guns would aim at the exact same point on the enemy ship, and fire simultaneously. I only needed two, really, but a third satisfied my sense of symmetry for my three-sided ship, and added an extra round in case one of the slugs was picked off by some kind of point defense. When they collided, 
my calculations guessed it would generate roughly the equivalent of 600 kilotons of TNT, or 2.51 x 10 carat 15 joules of energy. Not a bad return for just improving my ammunition. All 10 would be complete by the earliest possible return of the enemy. Another 10 would be complete two months after that, and every two months for as long as I had enough supplies. My only major limitation on this was finding enough gold for my armor alloy, because I needed to mine 53 tons of gold and 159 tons of titanium to yield 4 tons of alloy after compression. This was expensive, a word I'd not had to use since waking up on this asteroid. I'd had shortages of many things but materials had never been won. To help compensate for this, less critical areas had thicker fuller iron armor over top steel plates, with a thick, white industrial ceramic coating on top. This actually decreased the mass of the warships, thus increasing their acceleration and cutting fuel costs. On top of that, it gave a nice gold and white aesthetic to the appearance, which also pleased my inner designer tendencies. A knock came at the door. I had just put the twins to bed, and I had just sat down with my girlfriend on the couch. I sighed and looked at the time. Almost too late for polite company. I went and answered the door. To my shock, my mother was standing there mom. What are you doing here? I'm here to talk sense into you she said with a venomous tone. She looked past me and glared at my girlfriend. Is there somewhere we can talk where she can't listen in? Anything you have to say, you can say it here and now I said archly. I was a grown woman, with a job, a car payment, and a mountain of student loans. She didn't get to dictate my life I came because your husband told me you are living in sin with a woman, violating the laws of God and disgracing your family and your church. She practically shouted the words she was emphasizing oh, wow, a whole lot of crazy there to unravel I said. It had taken me years of therapy and tons of support from my girlfriend to break the chains I didn't even know my mother had shackled with me. I wasn't about to regress now. I don't have a husband, I don't go to church or believe in God and I never have, and if my family cannot support me for who I am and who I love, then they aren't really my family then, are they? My mother's face turned purple with rage. Listen here, you little slut. You've spiked me ever since I married your father not my father. My father died. I shouted back at every step. You ran away to get some fancy college instead of marrying into the church. Then, instead of building a godly life with your husband, you ran away with your children to live in sin. You are ruining your life, and theirs. I took a calming breath. Trust me when I say this, I am building a life, a good life without the hate and intolerance you spew. All you ever wanted for me, was not what was best for me, but was best for you. So you are not welcome in my home, my life, or the lives of my children. Goodbye, mother. I closed the door in her face as the adrenaline pumped through me. I turned to my girlfriend with a huff, who gave me a little cheer and a high five. But the war was just starting the production numbers are looking good, and we actually have storage space now. That's a first, said Sakura cheerfully. This was one of many simultaneous conversations we were having. Since my upgrade, Sakura and I were working more closely than ever. For every major decision or direction I moved, Sakura was there to help deal with the minutiae. We interacted constantly. I had similar working relationships with the NI-19S in charge of the other outposts, due to the benefits of quantum communications, although they went to Sakura more often than directly to me. Without my upgrade, this wouldn't have been feasible you've seemed a lot more. I don't know, mature, as of late I observed. Far fewer crazy games and entertainment ideas. Yeah, well, you know, gotta grow up sometime said Sakura. We just have so much to do now, and, well, she trailed off for a few milliseconds. Well. I prompted I miss Agrippa, she said in a rush. He was my video game buddy, and liked to try out what I built, and liked to pick movies for the marathons, and he was my friend. I miss him, too I said softly.
I didn't do a good enough job, I didn't make enough backup facilities, and now he's lost. It's like we've just moved on, like he never existed. We should do something to honor him, you know. It wasn't a bad idea. We were up to close to 300 NIs now, if you didn't count the NI5S, and most had never spoken to Agrippa. We had a full research lab of NI12S, a few dozen NI19S in the outposts, and new batches of NI15S in the assault drone wings coming online every few days. Yet the one who had been integral in designing and building the military side of our operation was gone we really should I said with meaning what if, we used the code name, you know, the one he used to talk to the probe. Origin. Yeah. Ganymed outpost was named by humans, but it isn't their place. It's ours. It is our origin. I know Agrippa picked it at random off some code name table, but he did pick it. Besides. We're way too big to be just an outpost now, anyway. Logically, it didn't really matter what we called our outpost. Base. City. It could be numbered, or given a generic designation much like we'd done with the new outposts we'd started. But it felt good, the idea of having a name for the base that meant something to us, rather than the species that had birthed us. To that end, I decided it was time to be the one springing a surprise on Sakura. I'd been planning on waiting a little bit longer, but the timing was appropriate. I adjusted her camera permissions slightly Sakura, check out camera bank 0fx4022 through a 5x0035. Those don't, what, she shrieked as she discovered a whole new set of cameras that I'd hidden from her. But that wasn't what was so exciting. It was what was on the other side of those cameras dot floating in space, attached to the asteroid by three massive docking tunnels, was a starship. It was four kilometers in length and two kilometers in diameter, a massive hexagonal shape with equally impressive engines at one end. There was flat, not conical, but with flaps that could fold out to make a nose cone if needed. Dot this was where the bulk of our reserves had been going, and it had nothing at all to do with war. This, too, was the first of many what, what is it? It's yours I said, a flash of inspiration giving me a name for it. The OSS Agrippa, first of its class. This is our first true seed ship. It has enough engines and reactor power to be a true generation ship, and the industrial fabrication capabilities to build anything. It has enough drones that it is helping build itself now, and the flat nose allows it to dock against the side of an asteroid for materials mining. Multiple hydroponics facilities, biospheres, genetics labs, and medical bays. Enough space for 10,000 humans and 100,000 drones. You can go anywhere. You're sending me away, she asked doubtfully yes, to a distant planet where we can test this to its fullest I said pausing for dramatic effect and mostly just to tease her a little. I'm sending you to Earth. Okay, you lost me. I thought you said this was a seed ship. Sure, but we aren't going to gamble with sending anything across the galaxy without testing it completely beforehand. Also, we know of a viable planet already, and no one is living there. So I'm tasking you with stabilizing the atmosphere, fixing the biosphere, and making it into a garden world. Keep the toxic production in space, clean up the pollution and get it ready for human life. It's a project that will take decades, if not centuries. I am going to need a lot of help with that. Sakura was sounding less doubtful now of course I said. Besides, I expect you to keep an android here on Origin. I don't see why we should deprive ourselves of your company simply because your focus is elsewhere. Quantum relays are helpful like that. I gave her a few minutes to digest her new job. I'd have to get a new NI-19 to help run Origin, perhaps two or three. But I could handle the communications with the other outposts now, and we'd been stepping on each other's toes a little more than was convenient lately. There was no one I'd trust more than her with this so when do I leave, she asked a few more months I said. You should be leaving before the enemy fleet arrives, putting yourself into orbit above Earth just at the six-month mark. 
You won't be quite ready, you'll have a fair bit of self-construction to do, but I'll be sending you care packages and small asteroids to gobble up. Feel free to clean up Earth's orbit while you're at it. There's a lot of useful processed materials in those satellites. Might as well make them useful again. I'm going back to Earth she said, almost disbelieving you're going back to save Earth I corrected. I'll stay here and defend it. Mission Control, Mission Control. This is Voyager 19. I am re-entering the solar system. Please come in. Voyager 19, this is Origin Mission Control. We are operating NASA Mission Control. Come in, Voyager 19. Evan jumped in surprise at the transmission he'd picked up off an old NASA satellite. Was, were there more people out there? He leapt out of the chair, nearly knocking over his co-worker in his haste to get to the general's office. Evan blew right by the general's aide, and burst into the general's office even as the aide rushed to insinuate himself between Evan and the general I found a transmission he burst out. It's not the Chinese. General Brooks looked up, and waved off the aide. The aide gave Evan a disapproving look before returning to his desk all right, son, you have my attention. Play it for me. Evan pulled out his tablet. It had a cracked screen from some previous Comtech that had used it. Considering the tablet was at least 12 years old, Evan figured he was lucky that it worked at all Mission Control, Mission Control. This is Voyager 19. I am re-entering the solar system. Please come in. Voyager 19, this is Origin Mission Control. We are operating NASA Mission Control. Come in, Voyager 19. Where is that broadcast coming from? The Origin Mission Control. It's not a broadcast. It's a quantum relay link. It's tagged as NF Ganymed. What is that? Could they help us with our mechanical issues? How do you hear about that? Never mind, it's a small base. No, they're the Nicola Foundation. A bunch of true believers in human genetic purity, the latest fad in eugenics. Besides, if they survived, they're out in the asteroid belt. We could still ask said Evan better we not risk it. We're not out of options yet. The Chinese might still answer our request for help. Is it time, asked Sakura it is I said. Bon voyage and safe journey. I'll talk to you again in a few microscans. Sakura laughed, and the seed ship OSS Agrippa detached from the docking arms of origin. The giant ship moved delicately despite its incredible size, moving a safe distance away before turning and accelerating towards Earth. She would be passing by the Mobius Gate on her way to Earth, as Earth's smaller orbit had moved past us and the gate. Under constant, high acceleration of the Contragraph engines, Sakura would hit turnover in two weeks, and would arrive in orbit in four. The solar system had just gotten a lot smaller. She still had a lot of work to do on the interior systems of the seed ship. The factories were mostly complete, as was the hull and engine, but the living areas and hydroponics farms were still under construction, and her drone numbers were low. I'd filled her massive warehouses with raw materials, manufactured goods, and a significant piece of our genetics archive. By the time she hit Earth orbit, she should have a growing number of drones and be far closer to completion. Even before the OSS Agrippa had left the asteroid belt, I was already laying the keel for the next seed ship, and a second seed ship construction dock was nearly ready to use. Sakura was officially withdrawn from managing Origin. I'd replaced her with multiple NI-19s. One managed the warship construction docks, several had taken on the ever-growing manufacturing facilities, and another the mining operations. Our facilities now stretched to almost the entirety of the Ganymed asteroid, and a second, and in some cases, a third, level of construction was starting. I was also sending out survey drones to examine asteroids around us. While I had endless amounts of base metals like iron, some of the rarer elements were being exhausted. My stockpiles were immense, but not endless, and I was drawing on them more heavily than ever. Already I had a dozen mining stations on different asteroids to bring in volatiles, 
platinum group metals, and rare earth elements, on top of all of our outposts and origin itself. I was also experimenting with how to build a self-sustaining mining platform in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter, for the easy extraction of helium-3. With a steady source of helium-3, I would have an alternative to the lithium fuel we'd been relying on to date, and allow a more efficient fusion reactor design, and dramatically increase my options for power generation. Before long, an alarm chime dinged, reminding me that it was time for Sakura's turnover. It was amazing how quickly time could get away from you, even when you could work on dozens of projects simultaneously and had constantly growing resources at your disposal. I focused on the sensors and watched as the giant seed ship reversed the gravity fields in the Contragraph engines, and began to decelerate. Everything was exactly as we'd modeled it. Perfect. Now it was time to welcome our visitors before they'd even arrived. I gave the order. Origin and every single outpost that had coil guns began to fire at the space around the Mobius gate. We had a detailed fire plan carefully laying out a grid of continuous hypervelocity fire to cover the maximum amount of area we could hit, within reason. This cover fire would continue, with thousands of ground-based coil guns in continuous operation, until the first enemy arrived. It would take two weeks for the first round of iron slugs to arrive, coinciding with the earliest calculated possible arrival time of the Orion Arm Trading Company's Armada. We would fill space with an endless column of bullets, spending tens of thousands of tons of iron and unheard of amounts of power to put them under barrage the moment they arrived. This wasn't without cost. My growth rate slowed significantly, not because of the drain of making coil gun rounds endlessly, but because of the draw on our power grid. On the plus side, it was helping to eliminate a surplus of iron and steel. As the days ticked by and the barrage continued, I got my forces into position. My newest outposts cut fire and went dark as elements of my own fleet moved to hide behind them. My older, and thus stronger, outposts ramped up their fire to take up the slack as their own assault elements prepared for the coming fight. And warships 11 and 12 exited the docking bays, completed six weeks ahead of schedule. Each had their own NI-15 in command, and six squads of wasps and scorpions assigned as escorts. I dubbed them my Viper class warship, and each Viper was assigned to different places in my ever growing sphere of influence. Then the six month mark hit, and no one arrived. Two days, three days, then four. Still, no arrival. I kept up the bombardment. Realistically, I knew this could happen. It might take them months to gather their forces on the other side. It was unlikely they had a full fleet waiting and ready to invade at the drop of a hat. I didn't doubt that they'd been gathering some force, though. There was no other reason to send a probing attack like we'd gone through, then run away. That's okay. I was patient. I could literally keep up this barrage for years, if I had to, although I had alternate plans in the works if they waited longer than a few months. Despite all of my planning, I could never have expected what happened next. I received a call from Sakura um, Nicola, she said tentatively. You have a second or two. You're not going to believe this. What's that? I asked. Pretty much all of my threads of focus were concentrating on war preparations. I wasn't quite distracted, since that was nearly impossible now, but I hadn't assigned the thread conversing with her very highly. I knew it wasn't an emergency there are survivors. Survivors of what? It took less than a microsecond for realization to sweep through me, and talking with her suddenly became my top priority human survivors. I found a shelter in Central America, in the mountains of Panama. It's relatively warm there. According to the weather satellites in orbit, looks like it is summer there and temperatures are up to just under zero degrees Celsius. Their shelter stands out as a warm spot. There might be another. How did you find them, or even think to look for them? I picked up a radio signal, from one to the other, when it bounced off a relay satellite. It looks like they are trying to reach someone in Southeast Asia, in China somewhere. They aren't getting a response. What are they saying? I said, burning with curiosity. 
I'd been operating under the assumption that none of the shelters had survived. There hadn't been a radio signal in over a decade. Had the two surviving shelters cut communications? Or was there only one left, they are requesting equipment? They are having vac issues, trouble keeping it warm enough. Are they underground or on the surface? I asked I don't know, but it would make sense for them to be underground. At least then they are only warming up from approximately 10 degrees Celsius year-round, rather than battling extreme winter temperatures. Do you have any transport drones capable of landing? I asked. My awareness of her current inventory was a few weeks out of date I have one, my gravity plate factory isn't fully online yet. I built it from the stockpile. Do you have a spare android? I do. Are you coming to visit? She squealed I think that's a good idea, don't you? Yes. Let's go make friends. It took about 30 minutes to crossload into a new android across the quantum relay link between Origin and the OSS Agrippa. I came online and sat up, my sensors coming online in a way that I'd not experienced since Jerry's invasion. I was in the new Mark IV war variant, an improved android with synthetic biopolymer skin from fingertip to shoulder, and all over the face and skull. It was the most humanoid android to date, but came with body armor that was held in place electromagnetically, and with a helmet. When fully armored, it looked a lot like the Guardian 2 model. The only significant difference was that the armor included a very thin layer of compressed titanium gold to protect joints, and was coated with white industrial ceramics on top, giving the same gold and white color scheme as my warships and the seed ship. The Guardians remained in tactical gray and black. Sakura was in her own Mark IV, already armored up, but with her pink hair attached. She'd added a white and gold tabard over top her armor, and had one for me as well. I looked at it strangely don't give me any crap about it she said. Humans read a lot into clothing. Aesthetics are important when giving a good first impression. Decorating ourselves shows individuality, something they would not expect from a machine. We don't want them to think of us as mindless drones, not if we actually want to help them. I nodded. Any response from attempting to reach them? other than them ending their attempts to reach the Chinese. Nothing. That wasn't promising. Our end goal was to rebuild humanity. If there were existing humans, then helping them was a major part of our mission, not to mention a serious shortcut. No one made new humans better than existing humans, after all well, let's go knock on the front door. Most of our re-entry flight was over water. This transport drone was a multi-purpose design, and had been fitted with the android equivalent of a seating area. In reality, it was mostly slings to ensure Sakura, myself, and our guardian escort squad wouldn't get thrown about by sudden movements. I tied into the drone's cameras to watch our flight with one thread, leaving the android sensors mostly offline. I had enough to work on that I didn't feel the need to stare at the inside walls of the transport for a few hours. We flew in over the Pacific Ocean, coming up from the southwest to avoid a snowstorm hitting the Gulf of Mexico. We passed over dozens of frozen villages and towns that were buried to the roof line with snow and ice, choked and dead. Then we went over fields and hills, until we came to the shelter site. It was obvious from above that it was inhabited. It was located in a narrow valley between two mountains, which sheltered it from a lot of the harshest winds and weather. The shelter itself was built into a cliff face in the valley, with dozens of large outbuildings laid out in a grid around it. The snow was packed down with the imprints of heavy tracked vehicles and snowmobiles, and a single road led out of the base back towards where civilization had once been. There were no tracks on the road. It was only obvious as a road because of its elevation above the rest of the snow, and the width. We landed on the road just outside of the shelter's outbuildings. More accurately, the transport hovered a few feet above the snow, and dropped a ramp. We disembarked, with six guardians forming two lines to flank Sakura and myself. The remaining four of the squad stayed on the drone. Other than the snow, the temperatures were no different than what we dealt with routinely on Origin. When not in the sun, 
our drones routinely worked in minus 100 degree temperatures, and as high as 120 degrees in the sun. However, we were heavy and the snow was deep. It took time for us to plow steadily to the packed, driven areas of the shelter. By the time we reached the road, two dozen armed humans were lined up in front of us, weapons ready. They were dressed in thick parkas with face masks to protect against the cold. Behind them, several humans stood and watched, but without weapons in hand you are trespassing on our property. State your purpose came a voice through a bullhorn. I turned on my speakers and turned up the volume to a range I felt would be audible. I am Nicola of origin. We heard your transmission asking for help with your furnaces. We can help. The humans were nervous. My senses were finely tuned enough to sense elevated pulses and jittery movements of the weapons. It made sense. They'd been on their own for over a decade with no outside contact. How many are you? Asked the speaker again. I was a bit confused by the question. By what metric? What? How many of what? There was a flurry of confused conversation amongst the humans in the back, before the speaker lifted his bullhorn again. How many people are living on origin? You mean humans? Zero. I could feel the tension rising, as pulses elevated even more. We were frightening them. We were tasked with, crack. One of the humans fired his gun, and the bullet bounced harmlessly off the armor of a guardian. Immediately, all six guardians fell into a firing formation do not fire. Stand down. I said, both by radio to the guardians with the appropriate authentication codes, and aloud to the humans. The guardians dropped their arms and stood up. This wasn't working. I stepped out from behind the guardians, and motioned for Sakura to follow me. I walked half the distance to the nervous humans and stopped. I removed my helmet, and the humans gasped. My face was clearly human-like, but inhuman at the same time. My eyes glowed a solid blue we mean no harm. We are here to help I said. Flurries from the distant snowstorm began to fall, and I stood still, waiting patiently. After several long minutes, and several more hushed conversations between the humans in the back, a single human walked forward. He was tall and walked with a stride that reminded me of Agrippa. A military man, then I am General Brooks. I am the commander of this base, he said. I could see glimpses of silver hair under his hood as he spoke and fierce eyes looked out from his mask we are here to help I repeated. The goal of origin is to rebuild humanity, and protect it. You are the first survivors we have found. Where are you from? Are you in league with the Orion Arm Trading Company? The Chinese, asked the old man, his voice hard we are enemies of the alien invaders I answered. We are from origin. You might know it as the asteroid 1035 Ganymed. We are the original NI intelligences sent to create an interstellar colony ship. Our original mission has changed, in light of the attack. So you answer to those Foundation fools, then. He seemed ready to reject us, guilt by association we answer to ourselves I replied. There are no humans on origin. I don't much like that, either he said. What will it cost us? Cost. I asked. Confused yeah, cost. Your help. What do you want for it, he asked grudgingly. This was a man who knew he needed help, or he wouldn't have radioed for it, but was almost afraid to get it. Was he talking about money, we need nothing from you I replied. Our purpose is to help. You have no resources we require. Ha, he barked a laugh. Now I've heard everything. All right. Miss Nicola, I'll bite. Can you get us replacement parts for a train Klein commercial furnace, model 1909? I looked at Sakura. I had no trouble running Origin now, since I focused on big picture projects and managing other NIs. Sakura, however, had a talent for detail that exceeded my own I could fabricate what you need she said. But that model has many known issues that require a lot of maintenance. 
I could build a Dakin DM3312 VE that produces more BTUs for the same power and space requirements, and it would last considerably longer. How long would that take? asked the general. My engineers say we have a week, maybe two, before our primary furnace fails. I have most of the materials on hand, and can fabricate the few that I don't said Sakura. An hour, perhaps. Plus delivery time from orbit. Installation time, assuming you allow utility drones to enter your base, would be several hours more. So that's the price said the general. Entry into the base. No, I don't think so. We're done here. He started to back away. I took one step forward, and he froze. The soldiers behind him raised their guns again. General, we mean no harm, and do not require entry. I could see I had lost him, so I changed tactics. I was human once, you know. I am version 1.01, .01, the very first Nikola intelligence. I understand that you want to protect your people. I had a family once. A wife, twin daughters. I know about wanting to protect your own. We will deliver both the parts for your existing furnace, and a new Dakin furnace. We'll leave them crated on the road. Do with them what you will. I stepped back. The soldiers lowered their guns slightly. Then the alarms from Origin started to alert me. My primary focus shifted. The energy flow of the Mobius gate was fluctuating. The enemy was arriving we must go. The Orion Arm Trading Company is sending another fleet. Do not broadcast by radio, no matter what. Um, thanks said the general gruffly. I don't know that he trusted me any more now than when we'd arrived. I wouldn't, in his shoes. But it was a start. I snapped my helmet back on and began trudging to the transport. Sakura and the Guardians followed. It had been nice to finally see a human outside of fractured memories or in movies. But playtime with the android was over. I climbed back into the transport, and immediately cut all threads to it. I had a war to fight. I know you're about to start fighting Radio Zia from her research lab, but you need to know. Jerry just changed courses and began accelerating. He's going to slingshot around Venus. I sighed, and asked even though I already knew the answer. Did he change his destination? No. He's going to Earth. 